So getting the ball rolling, I'll, I'll begin reading uh, from page 24, top of page 24 of Listen Humanity. Obedience, this is Baba, Baba quoting. Um, Obedience is greater than all the spiritual experiences, but obedience for show is worse than no obedience. Even if one among you succeeds in loving me and obeying me, the purpose of the Sabbaths will be amply, even fully served. Otherwise, instead of my Sabbaths, you will have enjoyed a week's picnic. Now it is time for you all to have your midday meal, eat well, rest after lunch, and all be here at two o'clock. Baba rose from his chair and strode at once from the hall and out into a separate, into a small separate hut, which had been fitted up with a small couch and a few toilet articles for his use. The busily chattering throng remained in the hall, swirled in into small knots, large knots, dreamily moving individuals intent on not talking, and a few who instantly set off about their business. Soon the hall began to empty as nature added its reminder to Baba's injunction to eat. At last, only the muffled clatter and laughter of scores of lighthearted persons eating and joking could be heard. Even in late fall and winter, for this was Friday, November 4th, 1955, a brief rest in the heat of the day feels good in this part of India, although its greater altitude and scant rainfall lessen the discomfort experienced in the lower coastal areas. The excitement of being with Baba was not enough to keep more than a handful of the Sava Seas from relaxing and taking a brief nap after lunch. Long before the designated time, however, the majority were back on their feet and awaiting Baba's return. Soon the nature of the afternoon's agenda became apparent. A large tent had been erected some days previously at the front and to the right of the great hall. It was open on two sides and closed to the rear towards Arangaon and to the west. Its dirt floor was well covered with carpets and liberally sprinkled with cushions. At the enclosed end had been built a low platform and on this was placed more carpeting and a chaise lounge. In and around this tent began to accumulate a motley collection of villagers from Arangao. Here Baba was to receive the families of the small army of workers required to staff Maribad for the Sabas programs. Most of these people had grown up in Baba's aura as the four decades of his work had often centered at Maribad. To these villagers, he was more than a great religious figure for that would have commanded only veneration and a shyness born of awe. Each time Baba's car passed, brief paused briefly at the railroad tracks when driving between the Savas headquarters and Maribad, Maribad on the hill, or slowed to negotiate a hairpin turn on the dirt road near the village, scores of delighted children and mothers clasping the inevitable infant to their shoulders, reached out with shouts to touch the car or even the man himself. This was a person they loved. Now, many of them were to have the rare privilege of passing singly in front of him, to be smiled at by him, possibly even touched by him. The almost ecstatic veneration of the Indian for his religious master is something foreign to the Western mind. Inevitably, it involves a sacrifice of part, even all of the self. To the, to the Occidental, this appears dangerous. And in the East, where it is often practiced, it is still not without its dangers. Regardless, the Indian feels 
instinctively the necessity for spiritual progress. And to accomplish it, he works out a relationship to the teacher, which has no exact counterpart in the Occident. Occident. These people of iron gown, simple, poor, sometimes uncouth, often tattered, collected in the tent in anticipation of a high point in their daily life. Many of the small children were clothed only to their navel, and gaping holes in clothing often rendered questionable any real contribution either towards protection or modesty. But they were in their very best and their cleanest, and they had scrubbed their bodies and faces. The tent filled tighter and tighter. People began to spill up along the sides and over onto the front brand of the hall, and even into the sun beyond the shadow of the tent. Each worker at Maribad must have discovered that day that he had close relatives whose ties of blood he had never suspected before. A small chorus of male, male adults and boys began to sing to the accompaniment of bells. The air grew tense in anticipation. At the extreme far corner of the tent, a magnificent appearing Hindu woman appeared with several young girls who were apparently in her care. This was Godavari Mai, beautiful, gentle, shy, the chosen disciple of the late great Hindu met perfect master, Upasani Maharaj, now administering his ashram at Sakori. As the singing voices wove in and out of the complex tonal system of Indian music and the bells jingled even more insistently, Baba appeared at one end of the tent and made his way with characteristic speed to the platform. Hands were stretched up to him as he passed. A swirl of villagers threatened to draw him in like an undertow and would have absorbed him but for the firm action of his mandali. Erich bawled out orders in the local vernacular, Marathi and a long line of women and very young children formed to Baba's left along one side of the tent. This was the receiving line, and no king receiving his court ever had more excited attention. Before the line started to pass in front of him, however, Baba invited Godavari Mai to sit with him on the platform and her girls to stand at her side to the rear. As Godavari Mai took her place at Baba's side, a sense of magnificent spirit passed between these two people and swept out and over the rapt audience. No words can record the air of peace, beauty, devotion, and regard, which thundered in complete silence between these two. Why try? Words break their backs in trying to carry the slightest part of the load, describing what occurred that warm afternoon under the tent near Ahmednagar. Black faces, dark faces, light faces, everywhere the great round brown eyes of the Indian woman, so startling in their size and their framing of long black lashes, and thin penciled eyebrows. Fat stomached, lean stomached, fully clothed, half clothed children clutched to a shoulder or carefully led along the edge of the low platform. Anything to show one's devotion, a garland, a bouquet, a small wilted flower, a ripe fruit. The closer to horizontal, the closer to expression of one's feeling of veneration. But this could not be 
for Baba had long ago declared that greetings should be given upright, a function of the heart, of feeling, not horizontal. This was the one point of true confusion in a vast mass of physical confusion with straining Mondale trying mightily to keep the pressing eager crowd in line. Before each villager was to greet Baba, she was reminded that she was not to bow down nor prostrate herself, nor try to touch her forehead to his feet those age old symbols of veneration for the royalty of heaven. Yet, as each woman found herself actually in the presence of this deeply loved man, she became unstrung and instinct took over. Finally, the Mondali gave up trying to keep the women up late and contented themselves with preserving order in the excited line. At last, the women and girls and small children had passed, and it was the turn of the old men, and then of the stripling boys, and finally of the workers themselves. And then it was done, and the villagers returned to their homes, and Godavari Mai and the girls left for Sikori, and Baba drove off to Mirazar, near Pimplegaon. There was a beautiful sunset that night. The loosely scattered clouds scattered back to earth, the pinks and the scarlets and the purples for more than two hours in a colored symphonic postlude. Marion. The night crept on. The lights winked on at the Savas quarters, and the lamplighter lit the gas mantle lamps at Meharabad on the hill. Pandu, the attendant, trotted whistling up the stairs to turn down the covers on the two guest beds, and the night watchman took up his seat at the front gate and began the periodic dry cough with which he accented the night. Well, did you enjoy the day, Don? I've never known anything like it. The morning of discourses and sporadic horseplay, the afternoon of a kind and depth of human devotion I've never seen before. It's very difficult for me to comprehend it all, to be a part of it and not feel that it's happening a million miles away and I'm looking at it through a giant telescope. Yes, one has that feeling a bit at first, but it wears away, and then you wonder how it is possible to live any other way. I can't help but think back to Baba's discussion of obedience, Francis. It goes so far beyond anything I've ever worked out or even speculated about that I get lost. It is rather hard for a Westerner. Our trouble is that we have absolutely no idea of the use of obedience as a spiritual tool, at least the kind of obedience that is really important. It makes me think of a story I once read of a great king, Mahmud of Ghazni who was also a spiritual aspirant. He had one slave, Ayaz, whom he appeared to prefer above all his great courtiers. This created some jealousy in his court, so he decided one day to demonstrate to his nobles just why he preferred this slave to all others. Mahmud had two heavy stones placed before his throne. And on one was laid the finest jewel in his possession. He asked one of his great nobles to come before him. And then he told him to pick up the second stone and smash it down on the jewel. 
the courtier was thunderstruck, and when he had recovered his speech, he began diplomatically to try to argue the king out of his decision. Finally, Mahmud told him to go away and called for a second great noble who was in the court. Again, the same command was given with the same results. Once more, the king ordered the reluctant noble away and called his slave. This time, on Mahmud's order, Ayaz promptly picked up the second stone and brought it instantly smashing down on the first. The precious jewel was shattered to dust. To test Ayaz still further, Mahmud berated him soundly before the court for having destroyed the magnificent gem. Finally, after Mahmud had run out of breath, Ayaz, who had stood quietly all the time, bowed his head and said, the fault is mine, my Lord. Chapter three, the toe of the master. As Baba came into the hall that second morning of the first week, or was it the second week or the third or fourth, there were more garlands and insistent chorused shouts of Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai. First one cohesive knot would give the cheer and one or two more garlands would be placed around Baba's neck. Then another group in another section of the hall would chorus out like a cheering section at a football game and more garlands would be hung. After this had continued for some minutes and several slight diplomatic pressures on Baba's part had not served to quiet the enthusiasm, it became apparent that he had made up his mind to firm action. He raised both arms high in the air and at once the hubbub subsided. Compared with the essentials for the path, the three most unimportant things are to garland me, to bow down to me, and to sing in my praise or perform an arty. These are not necessarily the signs of love for God. I know well that you garland me with love. This is a good idea when we first meet, but why do it every day? I have only two coats of the color, pink, I like most, and one is already spoiled by repeated garlanding. Do not waste any more time in garland, garland me, me, garlanding me tomorrow. Let us not waste money and let me not be burdened with garlands. Don't shout Avatar Meher Baba Kijay every time I come in and go out of the hall. What is the use of that? Keep shouting, but do so within your hearts so that only you and not others may hear. Like abashed schoolboys, the group sat looking straight ahead, unwilling to catch a glance from the corner of a neighbor's eye. Momentarily, the air hung tense with the light reprimand while Baba looked keenly over the hunched heads and forward leaning shoulders. Did you sleep well last night, he asked. Yes, Baba, was the general reply. Who did not sleep last night? Slowly, one man stood up near the door, heavy brown scarf wrapped tightly about throat and head, eyes inflamed, nose running. His diagnosis was promptly read by almost 300 pairs of eyes. Another and then another, then several rose to their feet. Why didn't you sleep last night? Because I was so happy to be near you again, Baba. 
And why didn't you sleep? My stomach was upset, Baba. I think I ate too much dinner because I was so glad to see all of my old friends again. And you? Some of the Parsis were playing cards and I couldn't sleep. I do not think they should play cards when they are here to learn of God from you. Baba was prompt with his reply. What has playing cards to do with one's love and longing for God? Playing with cards is better than playing with the whole of life. Shams Tabrizi and his famous disciple, Mulana Rumi, were both very fond of playing chess. Shams' greatest work was done at the end of a game of chess with Rumi. When Rumi lost the game, he could not help crying out to Shams, I have lost. Then and there with the words, no, you have won. Shams gave Rumi instant God realization. But come now, Baba continued, as he again looked searchingly at the audience. Many of you look sleepy this morning. Once more, quite honestly, who all did not sleep last night? Under such persistent prodding, several others rose, among them a slender boy dressed in white shirt and white shorts and with an American style crew cut. Why did you not sleep? There was a struggle for emotional control in the handsome face of the youngster, but finally, he placed his hand over his eyes and wept. I could not, Baba, because all night I could not help remembering the happy times in the past when you used to stay at De Radun. He choked out between his quiet sobs. Baba looked gently at him for a moment and then turned his attention to another heavy set intelligent looking fellow of middle age. And you, what kept you awake? I did not sleep because I was remembering you all the time, was the simple reply. Staring abstractly over their heads, Baba seemed to be thinking momentarily about the various answers given to him. Then recollecting himself, then recollecting himself, he motioned to them to sit down and without a moment's hesitation, looked straight at a very thin fellow, perhaps in his early twenties, who sat just in front and to the right. Why do you look so pale and tired this morning, Erich translated. I admit that I do not feel well and I did not get a good sleep the pale one replied as he rose reluctantly to his feet. Why did you not rise to your feet when the others did? I'm a young man, Baba, and I did not want to complain like an old one. Baba shook his head. It is natural for all those who have bodies to develop ailments. Both young and old alike can catch colds. Youth in itself is no protection against disease. In exceptional cases, such as the one who becomes die conscious and does not return to normal consciousness, such a one remains naturally immune to contagion. But having come down to your level, even I can catch cold and become ill as naturally as you can you must take proper treatment. There's an asterisk. For more detailed discussion, see God Speaks, Mayor Baba Dodd Mead, pages 228 to 229, also appendix two of the present work. Thereupon the subject was dropped for that morning. Throughout the Savas weeks, however, the most enduring daily thing was the meticulous questioning of the groups and of individuals 
about how they felt and how they had slept. At first, one attributed this to the extraordinary attention of an extraordinary man. But soon it became clear that Baba was concerned that careful attention be paid to health at all times. Part of the reason for this became apparent when Baba himself began to develop mild cold symptoms after having been in close contact for days with hundreds of coughing, sneezing men. Frequently, he would take advantage of a slight pause to clear his throat with a faint rasping noise. The only physical sound which he was heard to make. Even his hearty laughter was silent. How did this silence affect those about him? After a first jolt, the fact was lost under a towering mass of thought and feeling. Many have remarked on the extraordinary fact that after a few brief moments of surprise, one never misses speech with Baba. But he seemed to have an impish problem on his mind. He brightened, a flickering smile playing around his mouth and looked towards the two doors of the hall, trying to find someone. At last, he gave up the search and began to gesture. In the basic spirit of my Savas with you, what I now tell you, I tell as to members of one family. This morning, I had a tussle with Pendu in my room before I came to the hall. Pendu has been bearing the brunt of planning executing and maintaining the various arrangements necessary for the Savas program. Originally, it was decided to invite only 150 participants each week at a total estimated cost of 20,000 rupees and to spend an additional 10,000 rupees for the poor. Here's an asterisk. A rupee is about $4,500. I had agreed with Pendu not to allow any changes to be made in the original plan, but letters and telegrams soon began to pour in and the number of participants began to swell as the appeals were irresistible. My lovers in Andhra have proved themselves real workers in my cause. My name has become a household word in many parts there. The same is true of those who love me and work for me in the Hammerpur area, where men, women, and children go about singing songs of love for me during their daily lives, whether in the fields or at home, or going to school. When the number 150 was initially increased to 200, there was a preliminary tussle between Pendu and me. At that time, he reduced the money to be spent on the four poor programs during the Savas month from 10,000 to only 5,000 rupees. Now the number of participants in each of the remaining Savas groups is likely to exceed 250. In one case, the total may reach a figure of 300. Due to the increase, Pendu must, among other things, have the dormitory extended and obtain more cots. Pendu now refuses to be responsible for sparing more than 1,000 rupees for the poor, but see how things adjust themselves somehow. Nozair, who died and has come to me, has left 1,000 for the poor. I have also accepted 1,000 for the poor from the balance of funds which the Andhra Reception Committee had left from the mass Darshan programs there. 
There's an asterisk. Oh, Darshan, a spiritual blessing given by a glance or touch. This brings the total to 3,000. Let us try to knock a thousand more out of Pendu in order to complete 4,000 rupees for the four poor programs. Have someone fetch Pendu from the office so that we can put this matter convincingly before him. A swarm of chatter arose from the audience as a messenger departed post haste from the hall and raced to the open office door at the end of the veranda. Almost immediately, Pendu appeared, a handkerchief muffled over his nose to prevent spreading of the heavy cold he had contracted just as the Savas programs were starting. You sent for me, Baba, he asked. Yes, Pendu, we have been discussing the money which is to be used for the four poor programs during the Savas month. I have endeavored to explain your difficulty in trying to keep aside enough for these poor programs. While every day more letters and telegrams pour in asking that the senders be allowed to come, Baba explained. Then he outlined further the amounts received from Nozair and the Andhra committee pointing out that the sum for the four weeks poor programs now totaled 3,000 rupees. Even in the misery of his cold, with Baba's intent look of urgency and scores of soft brown Indian eyes upon him, Pendu knew he hadn't a chance to resist the strategic nutcracker in which he was caught. Pendu, do you think that you could spare just 1,000 rupees more from your funds so we may then have 4,000 rupees for the four weeks and that will be enough? Baba looked his persuasive best. It will be difficult as you know, Baba, but if no additional persons are allowed to come, I will do it for you somehow, Pendu acquiesced feeling that by this further sacrifice, he had at least won public recognition of the fact that the size of the groups couldn't be allowed to grow anymore. Thank you, Pendu, Baba smiled. The Marathi group is the last to come. If need be, I will give them such interesting discourses that they will feel well satisfied with the cheapest food for the week. I know the trick of it. Then he turned his gaze back from Pendu to the audience. When I tell you things like this, do not forget, as I often tell you, that under all circumstances, I always remain what I really am. Since for all practical purposes, I am amongst you. I also remain practical about everything and take care of the most minute details. I have asked Pendu and I to send to all participants in my Savas a copy of the complete accounting of expenses taken from the 30,000 some odd rupees contributed towards the Savas weeks. With this, Baba rose and signaled that it was time for the mid-morning break. No game of seven tiles was proposed this time, however. And in a few moments, the major part of the group had left the hall while Baba disappeared through a distant doorway. The day was already warm and scarves and sweaters began to be peeled off and the more usual light Indian dress came into display. Some of the sharp air of excitement had disappeared and conversation was more normal, even slightly lethargic as the participants rested in the assurance of three and one half days yet to come.
A light drone of voices rose from the cluster of white stuccoed buildings, occasionally bejeweled by small metallic clanks ringing from the kitchens or the dormitories, or even from the belled oxen and water buffalo in the surrounding country. Like waves on a seashore on a quiet, sunny day, the peace of India lapped up on the white sand of men's souls and ran back again into the mother sea, abrading softly, polishing slowly, sometimes rising, sometimes receding, occasionally thundering in stormy insistence. Through all of the undertone of nature working in harmony with the ancient heritage of a land of spiritual values, there ran another theme of greater urgency. This was the personality of Meher Baba, which quickened the vital current and lent to it a sense that something of great importance was happening today. Come and look quickly and feel and open up your hearts and then think of what you have seen and felt for like the flash of lightning in the heavens, it may be gone in the next instant. Thanks, Marian. Um, mm -hmm. Could you un unmute and continue for us? Can you note where? Yes. <clears throat> and, okay. An eddy formed in the peaceful buzz, which could not be lost. There was motion somber, significant motion. And the shimmering pool of sound began to ripple and move back and forth between its shores to find the source of disturbance. As if drawn inevitably to its center, the vicious mass of Sahaba seas began to flow back to the hall. I'm sorry, a vicus, mass of viscous. Viscous. <laughs> it means like sort of like honey or uh, syrup. <clears throat> syrup. Mm -hmm. The viscous mass of Sahaba seas began to flow back to the hall. As they stirred, as they stirred in. As they stirred in, in through the doorways, they saw the reason for their unconscious disturbance. Meher Baba was pacing back and forth with rapid, determined stride at one end of the hall. It was an interesting performance. It drew the curious onlookers like a, a lodestone and yet made them self-conscious with a feeling that perhaps they were watching some private function to which they had no right. A few of the bravest slipped out of their sandals and slid in through the door, quiet and attentive, as if watching a ceremony of deepest significance. The others contented themselves with watching through the doorways, uncertain of the properties of the situation. That's uh, proprieties. Yeah, proprieties of the situation. <laughs> As I love, <laughs> <laughs> I have I have unlearned my English as I was out of country. You're fabulous. Thank you. At last, Bobo finished. He loosened his light white coat and handed it to a waiting pair of hands. Clad now only in his loose white saddle and his full white trousers. His face and skin glowed with a soft pinkness, having come just to the point of a light sweat. He sank down in his large armchair, armchair and relaxed. Both. Some of you may be thinking that while engrossed externally in walking, 
Baba was engaged internally in his works on the spiritual planes. Actually, I was merely exercising to help my digestion and feel fresh. The great mystery was solved. As if by magic, the message seemed to be intu intuited, in, intuited, intuited everywhere that Baba was again in his seat and the doors were filled with the returning throng. One fine looking student from the University of Pune, Pune went over to Baba's side and began a low earnest discussion with him. It seemed that one of his university friends, a great admirer of Baba, but not one of those formally invited for the programs, had just arrived in his car and had asked for permission to remain over the weekend. Baba looked serious, no doubt cut in his web of an earlier weaving, looking carefully around, first to see if Pendu might be a witness to his inquiry, Baba finally raised his hands in resignation and nodded his acquiescence. acquiescence. The student slipped through the door and in a moment returned with a tall, lanky companion with camera and light meter hung around his neck. The two blended inconspicuously in, in among those sitting back to the rear. Baba cleared his throat lightly. The audience quieted and gestured and gestures started. Quote, rest assured, I definitely know from my living experience that God is the one and only reality and that all else is illusion. All that you see and hear at this moment, this hall, or being in each other's presence, these explanations which I give and you hear, and even my incarnation as the avatar, all this is a dream. Every night you go to sleep and have different kinds of dreams. Yet, every morning you wake up to experience a new, the same old dream that you have been dreaming since your birth into your present life in illusion. You will say, Baba, we are wide awake. We actually see you sitting before us. We can and do follow what you are explaining to us. But you will admit that you would say the same thing to me if in a dream you found that you were near me and hear me telling you that all you felt, saw and hear was a dream. As long as you do not wake up from a dream, you are dream bound to feel it to be stark reality. A dream becomes a dream only when you wake up. Only then you tell others that the life you lived in the dream was just a dream. Good or bad, happy or unhappy, in reality, the dream is then recognized as having been absolutely nothing. Therefore, I repeat that although you are now sitting before me and hearing me, you are not really awake. You are actually sleeping and dreaming. I say this because I am simultaneously awake in the real sense and yet dreaming. Real sense means one with God. That was a footnote. 
awake in the real sense and yet dreaming with one and all the dreams which all dream. All your pleasures and difficulties, your feelings of happiness and misery, your presence here and your listening to these explanations, all are nothing but a vacant dream on your part and mine. There is this one difference. I also consciously know the dream to be a dream while you feel that you are awake. When you really wake up, you will know at once that, you, that what you felt to be wakefulness was just dreaming. Then you will realize that you and I are and always have been one in reality. All else will then disappear, just as your ordinary dreams disappear on waking. Then they not only cease to exist, but they are found never to have really existed. From birth to death, you keep on growing. First you are young, then you grow old and die without knowing or caring from whence you came or whither you, or whither you go, or whither you go. From who am I to I am God is just one long, long dream covering ages and ages in time. But these two is found never to have existed in the eternity and infinitude of your own existence. At the moment you realize your real self or God. Every individual here and elsewhere is the same one, ever indivisible God. I say this because I am responsible for the whole creation. There's a footnote next to this. Asterisk. So Asterisk says in the bottom of the page 37, it must be borne constantly in mind that once one grants the reality of God realization or union with God, it follows immediately with such a God realized the individual would be speaking the simple truth when he said that all of creation flowed from him, that he was responsible for the whole creation, and that all creation was in him. This holds equally for the avatar, despite the presumably different mechanics lying back of his oneness with God. The ensuing statement, therefore, is a simple development of the logic of this essential fact of oneness. Going back, after Astrid, if I am not here, then not only will you not be here, but the whole creation with all its gross, subtle, and mental spheres will not be here. In short, everything exists because I exist. In your case, also the whole of creation exists because you exist. When you sleep soundly, then for you, everything, body, mind, world, and the universe vanishes and is absorbed in your sound sleep state, the most original beyond beyond the state of God. Then your consciousness tired of focusing on the illusion of duality is at rest within you. I repeat this again. Then your consciousness 
tired of focusing on the illusion of duality is at rest within you. After being refreshed in the most original, beyond, beyond the state of God, your consciousness plunges you first into the dreamy in sleep, and then you wake up once again within the dream of creation. This dream of creation emanates again and again from you and for you. This process of repetitive sleeping, dreaming, and awakening is a result of your inability to wake up in your sound sleep state. Means conscious union with God. Therefore, alternately, you remain asleep or keep dreaming either the dreams in sleep or the dreams of creation. It is only when you wake up in the true sense, God realization, then you find that you alone, God exists and that all else is nothing. Only after cycles and cycles of time can one attain one's own conscious state of God and find that one's infinite consciousness is eternally free of all illusion of reality. The whole of creation is a play of thoughts, the outcome of the mind, it is your own mind which binds you. And it is also the mind which is the means of your freedom. You are eternally free. You are not bound at all. But you cannot realize your freedom by merely hearing this from me because your mind contrives to entangle you in the illusion of duality. Again, but you cannot realize your freedom by merely hearing this from me because your mind contrives to entangle you in the illusion of duality. Therefore, you only understand what I am telling you and mere understanding cannot make you experience the truth which I tell you. For that truth, you must let your mind be halted and finally rooted out. Then as soon as you see me as I really am, everything else will disappear and you will find yourself to be your own eternal and infinite self. With this, Baba signified that it was time to halt for lunch. He instructed everyone to relax after the midday meal so that they might be refreshed for the afternoon. As he left the hall, Baba passed close to a thin middle-aged man dressed in the loose okri colored robe worn by ascetics, ascetics and known as a kafni. The unusual color cut his eyes and he seemed to think momentarily to penetrate through the robe to the man. What is this? Why do you wear the kafni, he asked. I have put it on only for the occasion of the Sahaba's program, Baba, was the reply. Baba speculated a moment, weighing the answer thoughtfully. We have to give the shape and color of detachment to our hearts 
and not merely to the clothes we wear. He suggested gently and strode on through the door. Lunch had hardly been eaten before a few stray persons returned to the hall. Among them was a young Parsi who sang and played the small harmonium. Soon the strains of devotional music floated out on the tepid midday air. Interest slowly um, agglomerated in the peaceful in the peaceful atmosphere and by ones and twos and trees the Sahaba seas drifted into the hall. Occasionally all raised their voices in common acknowledgement of the greatness of God. More often the melody and words were original to the player or even extemporized, uh, extemporized, A thin graying individual with deep set eyes slipped in between the singer and the wall and picked up by the small skin drums. Squatting, he placed one in front of his crossed legs and the other to his right. After a moment of flicking the surfaces to catch their tone and gentle tapping of the wooden pegs on the sides, which held the tension thongs, he too joined the tribute to the mystery of creation. Often the drumming would grow wild and insistent cut in the double intensity of the complex of the complex rhyme and, and the rapidly moving emotion of the inner man flowing through the channel of his art. Then instantly the crashing wave of feeling would be damped and the listener was cut in the antiphony of soft gentleness and quiet devotion. Imperceptibly, the sound of bells, like those on a winter slide, began to blend with the voice of the singer and the reedy tones of the hand harmonium and the complex beat of the drums. A very old man with long white hair and beard peering behind his great heavy lens spectacles at nothing had placed himself to the right of the sitting singer and was shaking a small set of bells bolted to a thin bar of steel. Even before the bells had been integrated, a fourth man joined the group by common consent, he began a long, by common consent, uh -huh. by common consent, he began a long devotional song on the greatness of the master while the absorbed audience clapped. The performers were deeply engrossed in the moving strains and the alternating swelling and dying or harmonies when Baba strode quietly into the room. At once the singer looked up, breaking the flow of his song of praise. With a short gesture, Baba indicated that he should continue and the melody began again while Baba clapped his hands in appreciative red rhyme. Occasionally, Baba would raise his head and shake it slightly, breathing heavily as he did so, as if from the immensity of the field. 
when the hind was over the the quar the quartet the quartet took up an extempore extemporization on Baba's toe. Even this small part of the master's body was too much for the singer to encompass. It seems that words, notes, and rhythmic beat must explode in the effort to translate the feeling of the soul. On and on it went. The drum and bells stopped periodically as the harmonium alone strove to accompany the, the singer in his pain. At times the harmonium too, the, at times the harmonium too was deserted as the voice soared on unaccompanied, on uncompanied. Un, un, un okay, I have to read this again. On and on it went, the drum and bells stopping periodically as the harmonium alone strove to accompany, accompany the singer in his pain. At times the harmonium too was deserted as the voice soared on an accompanied. When it seemed that there was no way to drink in even one fraction of the infinite ocean of feeling inspired by the smallest toe of the master. Baba called the song to a halt. Who he are, he beckoned, reciting your melodious voice, the Bonom, the Benome Yazdani in the name of God Almighty, means, Benome Yazdan, means in the name of God Almighty. As Puhiyar's serenest voice floated through the hall, Baba rose from his seat and folding his hands in front of him and with eyes almost closed, swayed slight, slightly with the rhyme of the powerful prayer. prayer. When it was ended, Baba remained standing and then began to gesture. Quote, for ages past, I have been telling people to leave all and come to me. That alone is the way to liberation from all illusion. We always live in the present. From childhood to old age, we always live in the present. We forget the past because it is not there at all. There is always the eternal present. Even the great ones often fails to get a grip on to get a grip on eternity. At Hyderabad, there is a well-known saint. His following runs into thousands. His following runs into thousands. But even he has yet to find out truth. Jisei Pata Laga Pai Uska Pata Hisiko. Nahin Lakta. This means none in capital. None can know the one who has found God. Then Baba sat down. For a few moments, he preserved the characteristic pose of, of abstraction, which usually served as a punctuation mark, mark as he transferred from one subject to another. Then he began to gesture again while Erich continued 
the task of clothing the graceful motions with a garment of words. Seems like a good place to uh, stop here and continue next time. Uh, that's page 40, folks. Okay. Thank you. Ah. <sighs>